and then going in college early, um, the amount of stress of the amount of exercise that you had to do and kind of two hours limbering up in the morning sessions, it was, I was burning the candle at both ends and it was, I had to make a decision really, you know, it was either stop the DJing and carry on with the course or stop the course and carry on with the DJing. So it only had to be, the, the decision could only go one way because the DJ was helped kind of support me for the course. So unfortunately I, I finished that and went full on into DJ, but actually, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't too, um, I wasn't, I wasn't too disappointed because the DJ thing, I mean, it enabled me to put myself full time into DJ, you know? So I decided to, I mean, I'd already started to do some, um, some local clubs, as resident DJ, because after a couple of years stint of, of having a mobile DJ set up, I kind of realized that um, it'd be a lot easier if I actually went and played at, at clubs, you know, and didn't have to cart all the gear around. So I was working at a couple of, a couple of local clubs initially in uh, St. Helens. There was a place called Pepe's and a place called Cindy's. Um, and I remember actually, I remember at Cindy's, I was, uh, I was actually mixing records. I mean, the decks that they had there were, yet again, belt drive turntables. So there was no very speed in that time, you know, no crossfaders, none of this stuff. And I used to keep a BPM book, which was a a, a folder with loose leaves in it of me uh, BPM in every single record that I bought and then putting them all in this book so I could have you know, sections where I'd get 110 BPM or whatever, or 120 BPM, and there'd be loads, there'd be two or three pages of every record I had at that BPM. So I could actually mix and match records together and mix them on belt drive turntables without a very speed, you know? Um, So that was a very precious thing for me, Uh, this BPM Bible, really, you know? Um, And I also started working at a place called Cagney's in Liverpool, um that was very much when i was at the dance drama college um so i started to do a bit of work in clubs i, I remember i did the I, I think i remember seeing an old an old flyer a while ago for the cagney's night i used to do and, it, and, and i remember the flyer on the flyer it said something like electro funk night you know because that's kind of the music that was going around at the time you know um i suppose that was oh i can't Trying to remember, trying to remember dates is hard. I think that might have been, might have been kind of eighty, eighty one, maybe, um, maybe earlier, maybe late. I can't quite remember. But anyway, um, so I was, I was starting to DJ in clubs, and I started to go on that journey. Really, you know, putting my records to good use, basically, and making some, and making some coins to go with it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because I had quite a vast collection by then. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all well, about, that's another thing. you know, not only that, you got to have money to go keep going to hunt for records. It's not like you got to have money to keep up with the addiction, as we said. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. It's um, a cycle because I remember having $100 in one hand an hour before I got to say vinyl mania and two hours later, I was asking for credit to hold the records. <laughs> I didn't have enough to get everything I wanted. It was just yeah. like, I remember that. It was. Yeah. I mean, I look back and I, I can't understand how I finance myself to buy all these records. Because literally, I mean, now, I mean, I mean I've mean, i reached a stage now where, I mean, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm sat in my studio here. And I've, I'll just point this to the top. I'm just in front of some of the records. There's a small, small part of my jazz collection at the top there. Um, and, you know, I'm here with all these records. Let me just see if, if this works. I'll just kind of around the side there with various other bits. This is just a small corner of uh, my place. And uh, over here I've got uh, computer kind of uh, speakers and all the all kind of gubbins there. And uh, it's... This record collection was 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 something that enabled me to to kind of do this this DJing quite well, you know. Um, and at the time, I was, as I said, I was reading a lot of uh, a lot of 
things like Record Mirror, James Hamilton's column, you know, because I was BPM in my records. I can't even remember what what I can't even remember what inspired me to start BPM in records. It might have been James Hamilton, um, and even mixing. I just gradually, I automatic, I, I kind of gravitated towards mixing because I just thought that at the time, you know, a lot of DJs in clubs kind of felt like that well they had to talk on the mic in between each record and i just wasn't interested in that it was, I was like ask you about that were you doing the emceeing as well hey you look really good on that dance floor moving right right you know what i'm saying you doing yeah that? well well i did a bit of that but i didn't want to i didn't used to do it overtly too much because i under, i realized that that's not what people were there for they were they were there to dance they were there to you know pick up uh, a partner maybe you know they were they were they were up for a good night out. They didn't want to hear some kind of, you know, egotistical person on the mic kind of bigging, him, bigging themselves up. I don't oh, know. Look at those new hairstyles and that new shirt, yeah, yeah. that kind of shirt of the day. It's like, ah, yeah. shut up already. Shut up. So I started mixing and, and developed my BJ, DJ uh, BPM Bible uh, to counteract this, really. So I could do long sections of just mixing different big tracks together. You know, and I remember one of the clubs that I worked at, in fact, it, it was Cindy's in St. Helens, um, where I ended up, I was sacked from the job because I wasn't talking on the mic enough. And it was, uh, and I remember I had a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of people were coming there to hear the music I was playing because I was playing, I mean, uh, I was playing Can things speak, like. Uh, Chad, can we have a word with you after you're set? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I remember I was playing things like um, uh, "Ease Your Mind" by Touchdown, a lot of early kind of jazz funk stuff and Brit funk stuff, um, and disco and stuff. Obviously, I mean, very heavily into the you know disco sound, um, and I got sacked because you know because I was mixing the music and and it's funny how things developed after that. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I do like to feel like I was I was right, <laughs> you know. Um, there was a few of you at that time doing that, but it wasn't that common yet. It was more the Tony Prince style. Get on the microphone yeah. and, and wind up the yeah. crowd with, with, with the emceeing and get them yeah. rolling. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is like, to me a radio DJ. Yeah, exactly. I might as just say, hey, good evening, everyone. We're here at the BBC. You know, it's like, oh, come yeah. on. You're presenting now. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, that that kind of led me to, um, I suppose, the James. What I mentioned about the James Hamilton's record mirror column, I remember reading in that one week that um, uh, he was talking about uh, UK mixing DJs because at the time we were obviously looking to America because that was the birthplace of a lot of this, and we were influenced very much. By America, we're very much into American imports and uh, stuff like that. And I remember James Hamilton talking about Greg Wilson and talking about uh, Greg Wilson's like the only mixing DJ in in the Northwest or or UK. I mean, there was another you know there was other mixing DJs around at the time like Froggy down south, uh, as well as Greg. But uh, I remember reading this, and I was because I, I was this young, hungry. I was young and hungry. I was kind of thinking. Well, he's not, he's not the only mixer. I've been, you know, playing at Cagney's and Liverpool, mixing stuff all the time and, you know. So I, I wrote this letter to James Hamilton and I was kind of going, he's not the only mixing DJ. I could, I'm, I'm over here, you know. And uh, I remember James Hamilton actually talked about that in his, in his column. You know, and I was amazed about that. You know, he, he was talking about, oh, I've had this letter from this this kiss kid called Chad Jackson, and or, or Chad. I had, had to, I kind of used to just go by the name Chad at the time. Said, this guy called Chad, and he's, uh, you know, and that ended up. I can't quite remember how I met him, but I I also uh, used to go to obviously a lot of clubs, and I used to go to Wigan Pier. Um, and Greg, Greg Wilson was the DJ at Wigan Pier. And uh, I used to go, I mean, I was just a dancer, as I said, and I used to go and dance all night, you know. I mean, I'd, I'd, I remember I didn't even buy any drinks. I used to go into the toilet and just drink water out of the taps and then just go out and carry on, you know. Um, and I remember I used to, uh, I used to love, I mean, uh, you know, I used to love Greg and what he played. Um, and 
somehow I, I, I kind of got, got to know him. Um, I think I talked to him once about our kind of when he first, when we first kind of met. And I remember him saying to me that uh, he remembers, he remembers that thing in record mirror. And then he remembers he was at Wigan Pier one night and uh, he was mentioning to, to some friend of his, you know, if you read that thing in record mirror, this guy called Chad. And I think one of his friends went, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that bloke on the dance floor down there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I ended up getting getting friendly with Greg, and uh, you know it was a meeting of minds really because I, you know he was he was a bit older than me, and a bit more experienced at the uh, mixing thing at the time probably, um, and he uh, we became great friends, and I used to you know I used to look after his house where he lived in Wigan at the time and. Um, and I used to go around and he used to let me practice on his on his uh, on his setup in his studio, which was I remember uh, it was an amazing early mixer. Um, I think it was actually uh, designed and developed by Froggy, uh, the the mixing DJ from uh, London. Um, the Matamp Supernova. It was a big silver mixer, and it had a crossfader on it, and that was just that was just like light years ahead of anything else. A crossfader. You know, and Greg obviously had kind of Technics twelve hundred turntables with a very speed on. So suddenly I was in like, wow, what's this? You know, you've got all this control over. And over they looked, and I remember when I first saw them, they looked beautiful and very expensive. Yeah, I yeah. how sexy those Techniques look when I first saw them. And for, I'll never forget. Like, yeah, wow. yeah, and. uh and I was just totally into the same thing as Greg was, you know. So we we became quite buzz and buddies for a while, and uh, and I, uh, as I said, he used to let me kind of practice on his on his uh, decks and stuff. And at the time, he was uh, he was doing he was doing Wigan Pier, and he was also doing uh, some really legendary. Uh, live and recorded mixes on at the time Piccadilly Radio in Manchester on a great great guy Mike Shaft on Mike Shaft's uh, soul soul and funk show which was I think every Sunday and it was you know as these times of the internet it's very hard for for youngsters to understand how few and far between these things were I mean Mike Shaft show was a, such an important show because along with maybe only one or two others in the area. It was the only place you could go every week to hear brand new music, you know, imports, dance music, black music, club music, you know, jazz funk, et cetera, et cetera, kind of somebody doing DJ mixes, you know, uh, and then obviously uh, things like electro and hip hop and, you know, and it these these things were so precious, you know. So Mike Shaft show was was the biggest show in the area. Uh, for that style of music, and Greg used to do the regular mixes on there, you know. So I used to record them religiously, you know, listen to what he did, got really inspired, you know. Um, and I remember he actually teaching me. Um, I used to, I think, I used to sit in on on a couple of his later mixes. Like he, it, I think the last the last end of year mix that he did for Piccadilly was the best of eighty three which was an amazing mix. Um, lots of kind of early electro, funk, electro, and kind of hip-hop in there, um, which was quite prevalent at the time. And uh, I remember at one time shortly after that, or during that possibly, he taught me how to – he's the one – from what I remember, he's the one who taught me how to tape edit. So reel-to-reel, -reel, editing the tape. Um and that was that was just fascinating. I mean, it was another skill that I could use, you know, which eventually became really useful. Obviously, in later years, I mean, um, I mean, when Greg gave up DJing uh, in uh, the end of '83, um, he basically handed over Wigan Pier and also Legend in Manchester, which he was working at at the time. There we go. That's the Legend sound. Sorry, not sound system. That's the Legend. Uh, lighting rig above the dance floor, which was just incredible. Um, uh, yeah, that was an, an amazing club, an amazing lighting rig. And, so, and so he handed the keys to you, or you were already working there? 
No, no, he 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 literally handed the keys to me, and I couldn't. I really couldn't believe it. I mean, I was like, you know, gobsmacked. Did you um, know why he was retiring? I mean, or should I say, leaving the profession at the time? Did he ever uh, mention? Well, at the time, he, he was kind of, he, he'd started to get into kind of production and stuff. So he wanted to, it was like that was his next calling. So it's it's kind of like he wanted to, he wanted to um, pursue that and spend more time pursuing it, you know, which, I mean, in hindsight, maybe it was a good move, maybe it was a bad move. I don't know. I mean, Greg's done quite all right for himself, you know. I mean, he's, especially in later years, he's got a resurgence, which is superb, you know. But for a short while after that, I've heard him talk about this and, um, you know, he, he, he kind of tried to get into the production thing and it didn't quite work. So he ended up in a little bit of a kind of, you know, no man's land in a way of not really DJing, you know, and not really having any production work. I mean, at the time, I suppose apart from things like Factory Records in Manchester and um, a couple of other labels, you know, the music business was was all London at the time, you know. Um, so it was quite hard to get into all that at the time, coming from the North West. Uh, so I think he he kind of went along that path, you know. So as I said, he, he, he handed me the keys to Wigan Pier and Legend, and I was... I mean, I was just amazed, really, you know. I mean, not just that, but also he kind of he gave up the, the mixes on the Piccadilly show as well. So I got handed the, the mixes on Mike Shaft's show. Um, so you not only do you do in the club now, but you're yeah. also a mix a master mixer on Mike Shaft's show. Um yeah. on Piccadilly Radio. Yeah. And you know, it was it was almost like I was I was taking the baton from Greg in a way because I was a bit younger than him and I was a bit kind of kind of quite hungry. I thought, right, I've got to if I'm following Greg and I had so much respect for his productions and mixes, I was like, right, if I'm going to follow this guy and not look stupid, I've got to be shit hot, man. You know. So I I looking back, I kind of took it to the next level in a way. Um, I remember the the. I mean, I was already getting quite heavily into cutting and scratching and things like that. So I incorporated quite a lot more of that kind of stuff in my mixes. Um, and also with the tape editing, since Greg had shown me how to tape edit, I started to get really deep into that and trying to get really good at that and doing stuff like, you know, I mean, obviously I'd heard, uh, I've heard things by the Latin rascals and people like that, you know, uh, in later years that, uh, you know, all that real bullet edits and real kind of intricate kind of stuff. I was really kind of getting into that zone, you know? Um, and so my first end of year mix, I mean, these end of year mixes on Piccadilly were, were um, at the time quite legendary, you know, because I said, there was very few things around that people who loved this style of music could, could latch onto. So um, the first best of, uh, mix that I did was the best of 84 and it was an hour long mix and um, I think I remember there was about 130 records in it and uh, I mean I, I, I kind of as I said I took it even more intense than Greg did because I felt I had to live up to Greg and I had to take it take it further you know so I spent months and months and months uh, compiling this mix in Piccadilly Studios. I remember I used to drive into Piccadilly and um, spend hours overnight kind of editing up in one of the spur studios, you know, this mix. And it, it wasn't even, I remember it wasn't even done on on, on uh, very speed turntables because they, I remember they had broadcast turntables in there. So, there were, so I was very, my BPM book came in very useful there, you know. So I was compiling this mix and editing it up and there was only about 20 seconds or so of each track and trying to get the best bits and mix them in and kind of try and craft this hour-long piece of, you know, a snapshot of the best records of the year, you know. Um, and the amount of time I spent, I mean, I remember we did a competition at the end of those mixes and there was three questions to win all of the records in the mix. There was... Question one was how many records were used in the mix. Question two was how long did it take me to do the mix. Question three was how many edits 
were in the mix. I mean, how was anybody going to be able to get those three questions right? But anyway, some people did get quite close. And I think that there was about, as I said, about 120, 130 records. I think the edits were something like 850 edits. And the amount of time was something like 90 hours to, to actually do. And just a real, you know, labour of love, if you like, you know? Um, I mean, it amazes me how I did it at the time. How did I, how was how I able to- How long did it take you to do this with the setup that you were working on, to finish from start to finish? How many days did you work over there? Well, it was days and days and days. I mean, it was I know like, it had to be. I'm listening to the amount of, uh, that's a lot of time. To put yeah, it was a period, over a period of, say, three months or four months, towards the end of the year, I'd started to, kind of compile this mix and uh you know i don't know how i did it i mean i couldn't put all that effort in nowadays i think i'd, I'd kill myself you know i mean so much effort so i did the best of 84 mix um and you know lots of people today um the best of 84 and also the year after the best of 85 mix that i did um the kind of one of those things that made my name in a way you know um, especially up north and in, in the UK, you know, they were they were just. I mean, people still message me today saying that how how much those mixes stand up now, you know. And I suppose they stand up quite well because they're quite fast as well. They, they, there's quite a rapid, you know, um, there's a rapid turnover of tunes in them because I was trying to cram in as many of the best tunes of the year as I could, you know. Um, so they probably fit very much with today's kind of, um, you know, short attention span uh, kind of, you know, kind of attitude of, of a lot of people. Things getting more condensed. Really. Totally. And as well, a lot of things happened around that time. I remember there was the records being, those what they were calling them bits and pieces, 1984, 1985, coming from America, bootlegs of all. Yeah. It's, I it's used to hot. love Chop, chop. I, I used to love all those mixes, man. I mean, I, I remember, I remember picking up, uh, picking up a couple of them, and just being trans transfixed and listening to. Because by then, you know, I'd had I, I had a half an idea of of how this was being done because I'd learned how to tape edit from Greg. I was starting to understand how how these were being done, you know. And, and by the time I got to the best of eighty four and eighty five mixes, I was quite proficient at really streaming these records together in a really creative way, you know? And that was such good training from a, from a production career, really, you know? And that's uh, funny you say that because I've spoken to, I've had, as you know, Ben Liebern on the show, Jens Lazat, uh, and others were doing that same type of what they call mega mix, master yeah. mix, and they were getting work from that. Yeah, yeah. Really? Well, I've been, well, I have heard other people mention the same kind of uh, beginnings as as me as well. Of bef even before that, I was doing, I was doing loads of tape edits on a cassette at home when I was younger. You know, trying to do my own extended versions of tracks that I really liked. You know, because I had a really good cassette deck which had a mechanical pause button that was the minute you pressed it, it would stop. The minute you released it, it would start recording again, and that was just just as good as tape editing. I found, you know. Because you could get exact and you could get kind of real runs of bullet edits and stuff, even with that, you know. And I, I used to love, I used to spend hours doing that. To so the pause master pro then. Oh, I used to absolutely love it, you know. I mean, that was that was that was why when Greg taught me tape editing, I, it wasn't that much of a jump for me. It was like, all right, so that's that's what I do on the cassette deck, and it's just I use a razor blade now, you know. So don't take the razor people and cut where the tape where the head is. You take it off the tape, off the head. You yeah. put it down on Absolutely. the block and put it on the editing block. Do not take the razor and do it where the head yeah. is. Destroy the head. Yeah, it reminds me of it reminds me of an, some other bootlegs. Night at the editing block. Night I, at I the know editing. those guys. I know yeah. those guys that did it. Yeah, brilliant. Tornado, a lot, all those guys, Ray Rock, Juan, they were all involved in that. Oh, I, we used to, I used to just worship all those releases, things like that. Any any kind of DJ mixes that made it made the way to vinyl were just like gold dust, really, because you could learn so much from listening to them, you know? 
And that yeah. thing I have to give credit to, I have to give credit to someone that really pushed that. And that's got to be Shep Pettibone because his oh. editings, right, there you go. His editings were a big influence on everyone around him from yeah. Latin Rascals and, you know, it's Albert and Tony Moran and yeah. you know, the other guys. And everybody was listening to him on the radio and wanting to do what he was doing and they were doing it their way. So yeah. like what you were doing, listen to what Greg did, you did it your way. You yeah. Know? yeah. I mean, those, I mean, was it, um, did he do the that Kiss FM Master Mixes album? Oh my God, did he do them? I mean, uh, those... those... With cowbell with the cowbell and ding ding, he added the cowbell, the, the edits, oh man. I mean, those records were gold dust for me. I mean, some of my favourite, favourite records from the past, you know. And as I said, you learn so much by listening to these things. Um, and also people, I mean, I remember way back, I mean, I know he's quite a, obviously a, a, such a well-respected and, and um, you know, legendary, you know, worship name now. But Larry Levan, I mean, I remember... I used to I used to follow um like religiously people like Larry Levan, Francois Kavorki and good old Francois Shep, all these guys, like gods. So I used to follow them because I was over here, over the the other side of the pond in this crazy little little land where I live here and listening to all these gods that were making this incredible music, you know, and um and I started to realise, obviously being so kind of anal about facts and information i started to notice things like you know i mean i think larry levan's name really come to prominence in my mind when i started to notice a lot of the records that i really loved over the period of a few years I started to look at the labels and realize that they were all remixed or produced by larry levan and it was just that sound that he had was you know so i've really you know worshipped people like that in the u.s and kind of, you know, been inspired by them. I mean, I even remember, I mean, Larry, his fir my first mix on DMC, when I started doing mixes for DMC, the Disco Mix Club, my very first mix, I think in 1985, was something called The Garage Groove, which was a kind of, uh, it was a, uh, uh, it, it was like a, <clears throat> what's the word? It was a, it was it, it was in homage, if you like, to, to Larry Levan and his kind of sound and whatever. It, and it it was it was I remember I remember it wasn't necessarily because I'd I'd actually been to Paradise Garage at the time and seen him play, but I just kind of knew his vibe and his style. And I think in that mix there was a lot of his remixes and stuff. Um, but also I, I included a couple of things which maybe in my you know the, the 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 craziness of youth. I probably thought this is kind. This fits. This is kind of his vibe. You know. So who am I to say what his vibe is? But you know, I was I was young and you know. But that was that was the very first mix I did for DMC, the Garage Groove, um, and that was obviously building upon all these things that I'd done before on Piccadilly with the best of eighty five and best eighty four mixes. You know. I, I want to show because now we're doing chron chronologically speaking. I want to show a picture because now I'm going to 84, 85. And I want to show everybody this. People take this in. Ready? Here we go. 1986. Look. Look at Chad. Go ahead, Chad. Explain who this guy is and where is he playing so that people know how legendary this picture is. Well, obviously, I've been playing at Wigan Pier and Legend following on from Greg. And um, I mean, a funny story as well about Legend. I remember in those days, I remember it was on a Wednesday night was the kind of, you know, funk, jazz, soul kind of electro-funk night, um, which I took over from Greg. And I remember people used to travel up from London to come to that 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 night on a Wednesday. I mean, I remember a couple of A&R and promotion guys from Island Records, Adrian Sykes and Julian Palmer, used to come up on the Wednesday night to hear me play, um, which I eventually ended up doing my first work in the industry as regards remixes and stuff for Island Records. But anyway, I'll, I'll get on to that. Um, and kind of because of the the DJ at Wigan Pier and, and Legend and also the, the mixes I was doing on Mike Schaff show, um, uh, the Hassie Ender had started uh, a couple of years before. See that, everybody? Uh, 
the Hacienda, 1986, in the booth, doing his thing. Yeah, and the Hacienda had opened, and, and basically I'd been going to it for a, for a couple of years, and obviously Greg had played there as well. Um, and I basically, I w- as I said, I was young and hungry, and I was thinking, I want to play this club. I really like this club. You know, so I, I don't know how I did it. I mean, I can't, I can't do it now. It's like that almost blindness of youth of not knowing the the boundaries. I was just like, right, I want to play this place. Who's the guy who's the booker? Who's the guy who's the manager? I went to see Mike Pickering uh, from M People, who was the the booker and manager at the time at the Hacienda, and um, I went for a drink with him. And basically, I think basically I just said, you know, I really need to to play here, man. Is there any room? You know. And uh, he basically said, yeah, yeah, do, you know, we've got a Saturday night uh, if you want it, you know. So um, 85, 86, I started playing Saturday nights at the Hacienda as resident DJ. And that was, you know, before it became the, the kind of house music cathedral that it that it became afterwards, you know. Um, it was very, very eclectic. I mean, I remember, excuse me, some of the, some of the tracks I used to play were, uh, you know, really diverse. Um, I mean, that was one of the beauties with the place at the time, which is why I wanted to play there. It, it wasn't just kind of club music. I mean, house music hadn't even really become a thing by then. But, um, you know, 85, 86, I was playing crazy things like Fan Gadget, Back to Nature. Um, I was playing things like... Um, uh, mum, 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 mum. Um, 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 oh, my, my memory fails me, man. I tell you, it's, it's um, things like uh, Blamange, Feel Me, uh, loads of different styles of music. Obviously, kind of some disco tracks and funk tracks, and um, and then some early, some of the early, uh, I mean, lots of the electro funk stuff like D Train and Cinnamon, and um, and then lots of lots of the uh, early, I mean. Uh, lots of the early house stuff as well. I mean, I remember I got into house really early because it was very percussive and quite fast, and it was kind of four four based. Going back to the Northern Cell thing, that was very much the same lineage. I was just following this kind of sound really. Um, and I remember, I mean, somebody's actually mentioned in the past that um, they think that I was one of the first people to play a house record at Hacienda because uh, while I was working there, some of the first house records came out and I remember we used to all buy records on a Saturday afternoon at spinning records in Manchester and uh, Saturday afternoon to get all the new imports in. And luckily, you know, cause I was playing at the Hacienda at the time, I got kind of one of the first shouts of everything that came in. And I remember picking up these new records, things like um, Jesse Saunders on and on. Uh, I remember music is the key by jam silk I remember distinctly playing that in the Hacienda. Um, I remember playing, I think it was the Basement Key mix on the B-side, uh, which was a lot more percussive. And uh, and I was just immediately really into this sound, you know? So I was playing that. And it, it wasn't really that popular at the time, you know? It was kind of... Uh, I, I think I remember I've heard... I mean, somebody came came up to me and, and kind of said this to me when I was in the box at the Hacienda. But I, I remember hearing Graham Park say that the same thing happened to him. People used to come up and kind of, you know, they'd knock on the on the door of, of the box. And if you heard them, you kind of opened a, the little hatch. And, you know, you used to get guys kind of going, what are you playing all this gay music for? You know, and it's just crazy. You know, I mean, totally different place, the world in, at that time, you know. But anyway... That all soon changed, you know, with the advent of uh, the house music boom and the house music monster and ecstasy, really, you know. I mean, that all happened shortly after I left in the 86, you know. I went on from there. I, I, I kind of um, kind of wandered off into the mixing championships thing because I'd, I'd seen, you know, I'd seen a, 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 an advert about these, DJ Mixing Championships, the World DJ Mixing Championships being held by DMC. So I was really interested in that because obviously I was already doing that and I've been doing it for a good number of years. So oh, really? it's a natural, natural progression, really, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Take a good look, everybody. 
I said I showed this before. A cue stick. Look, he's gonna tell you why he took that cue stick out of nowhere and started doing what he does. Well, <clears throat> how he becomes world champion. Listen to this, everyone. Well, lead leading up to this point, um, the 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 Island Records thing I'd started to do. Um, doing mixes and remixes on Island Records, some of the first, luckily, some of the first things that somebody had done in the UK, uh, that was, yeah, that was Bunker Studios at Island Records with Stephen Street, who went on to produce Blur and people like that. So, you know, clever chap. Um, that was about, what was that? Was that like 84 or something like that, you know? Um, and I did, I did a few... Uh, remixes and releases like I did a Bob Marley um, kind of mega mix, I did Trouble Funk mix, I did the Third World remix that was released on Ireland and a High Tension remix um, and also an album called Crew Cuts and Crew Cuts Lesson 2 and they were kind of mixed and saying together uh, in the mastering suite at Ireland and that's, yeah, I was just going to mention that and I actually did a, a mix manual with the Crew Cuts album so that people could f use the actual two copies of the, the vinyl and actually practice mixing them in, um, kind of how they went on the on the actual uh, record releases, you know. Um, and that was quite early for, for those times, you know, and, and being given the chance to, to do that, I was just totally indebted to uh, Adrian Sykes and Julian Palmer, who, as I said, had come up to a legend on a Wednesday to – hear me play uh they got me involved in ireland i mean adrian you know adrian went on to manage emily sande and people like that so you know it's kind of you know i'm very honored to uh, have been given a chance by those guys and so all this stuff kind of developed further and, and as i said I, I i heard about you know i've been obviously dj mixing for quite a number of years and i heard about the the DJ World DJ Mixing Championships, and I just had to enter it. It was just, you know, that sounds like a like a great laugh, you know, um, a great laugh, but also very intense kind of thing to get into, you know. Uh, and I remember, I remember the first year uh, going in for it, and um, I'd spend months kind of kind of getting this mix together, and. The first year I entered it, that was um, that was 1986. And that was the second year that it had been running. I think it started in 85. And in 86, when I left the Hacienda, I kind of moved on to actually doing the mixing championships, really, and concentrating on all that. And, uh, and so I remember I used to – I think I used to go – because I didn't have any very speed turntables or anything like that at home, I used to go to a local club to kind of practice the set that I was going to do at the mixing championships. Um, and so I used to, I think, I think I used to, I think I used to go to places like William Peer and do a bit of practice. I think I even went to Greg's and did a bit of practice. So it's very hazy those days, but uh, I managed to, you know, uh, get a set together and entered it. And, and I, uh, in 86, <clears throat> I won the UK final and then um, went into the world final at uh, the Hippodrome in London. <laughs> and uh, I came second in the world, 1986, uh, in the world final. And the winner was DJ Cheese. And he was, he was doing lots and lots of scratching. That was the year when suddenly scratching um, became a really big thing, you know. Um, so I, I was in in my set. I'd have been I'd incorporated a bit of scratching, but also a lot of long, smooth mixes and and a development of the set, kind of to almost to keep people dancing because that was kind of what the original premise of of the competition was it was a dj mix type performance you know um so i was trying to cover all bases a bit of scratching bit of cutting bit of mixing the odd acapella run over you know um but cheese came in and he just smashed it up um not even not even keeping the the the, the flow of the of the bpm kind of going he just it wasn't about that at all it was about cut some stuff up 
bang into the next record, cut that up, you know, very much more the modern turntablism type of style, you know. Um, and he 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 picked me at the post and, and won the world championship because it was that kind of shocking and surprising, all this scratching stuff that people had never really seen so full on, you know. Um, so that really broke the scratching thing to a lot of people. Uh, I ended up, you know, I, I went on a bit of a world tour and also – after uh, after a few months, I think DMC uh, contacted me and said that um, the uh, the mixing championship for the following year, uh, for the next one, 1987, they said that Cheese had declined to um, uh, defend the title. And as part of the rules, if the uh, if the winner declines to defend the title, then the the, the opportunity goes to the runner up. So I actually got a free pass into the 1987 World DJ Mixing Championships, which was at the Royal Albert Hall in London. And and I remember spending months and months and months practising for this. And obviously, you know, since the year before, DJ Cheese had been doing a lot of cutting and scratching. I upped up the cutting and scratching a little bit, you know. Um, and I was developing this set and you know, using little bits. And also, you know, I mean, in those days, especially over here in the UK, we didn't really know about kind of, um, um, I mean, as I said, I very much came from a jazz background with, with the music I loved. So things like jazz players quoting other jazz players with little bits of their performance in a solo or whatever, I kind of incorporated that with one or two of the things I did in the world final. Um, I remember the, 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 there was a LL Cool J rock the bells bit, which I'd kind of, you know, I was kind of quoting Jazzy Jeff uh, from that because I think I'd I'd heard him once kind of do that, and so I kind of did that. It was almost like, you know, it's like kind of classic guitar solos. It's almost like, you know, a guitar player will come up and do some classic guitar solo that someone else has done, you know? I mean, in no way did I do it as good as Jeff. I mean, Jeff is one of my, you know, he's a good friend now and one of my total heroes and he's an absolute legend, a proper legend, you know? Um, he's such a such a seriously cool cat, Jeff, you know? I love him. But uh, so I was incorporating a lot of this different stuff and because I knew it was at the Royal Albert Hall, I realised that the place was huge. And so I was thinking very much about the the visual side of it, you know, because I, I didn't really want to be one of those mixing DJs who had their head down and was kind of doing this all the time, you know, and you didn't really see much showmanship, especially from the back of the, the auditorium, you know. So I decided to incorporate a few kind of little tricks like scratching with the pool cue, uh, covering up the mixer and just um, just spotting the the record, um, kind of looping around a certain section, just using the needles without the crossfader and all this stuff, and then a, a, a rugby ball at the end, kind of scratching with that. Um, so I wanted to make it very visual for the the people in the actual, you know, in the Royal Albert Hall, which is a huge place, you know, um, and. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll admit, um, I've never, I've never been the best kind of scratcher. I've never been the best kind of, you know, uh, technician in a way. You know, um, uh, there's other guys that are far better than me, and I absolutely love watching them. You know, uh, but it was, it was just this, you know, expressionism of, 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 of a bit of a bit of showmanship and a little bit of playfulness. I mean, I've never took myself too seriously, you know, and I do find that some of these guys take themselves a bit too seriously, not Jeff or anybody like that, but were it's, you, it's, you know. At that time, were you guys getting to hear Chuck Chill Out and Molly Mall and all the New York DJs that were doing that stuff on the radio mixes, scratching and everything? Was there any leads to you besides Jazzy Jeff and them? Yeah, I mean, we used to occasionally get hold of cassettes of, you know, things like, um, you know, Kiss FM in New York and and stations like that and hear people like Chuck Chill Out and whatever, you know. Um, and then, I mean, one of the other things that, that really kind of inspired me was I, I got my first chance to go to New York to the New Music Seminar in 86. Um, and just listening to the, to the radio, 
over in New York was just I I basically recorded every single show that I kind of tuned into because I was just hungry for this sound, you know. New York radio at that time was incredible. It was incredible. Oh, it, there was so many um, mixed shows on major stations, major records, so different than it is now. Oh my god. I'll tell you what I remember distinctly because of my production here nowadays. I remember the fizz coming through the compression and the radio signal on those New York stations really added to the sound for me. It was, you know, it was part of the whole vibe. You know, there's a real, I, that, that's the only way I can describe it. It was like a fizz, you know? And, um, and yeah, I got, I got entered into the, um, the new music seminar battle for world supremacy. I mean, I wasn't really prepared for it. I must admit I was a bit overawed, um, you know, this little kid from the UK suddenly going to, you know, the home of all this stuff and in front of all those all those legendary people, I was a little bit nervous and you know wait, wait, wait. So let's say what happened. Yo, let's check out this white boy. Yeah. Okay. Gonna do what he's gonna do for y'all. Let's yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Let's see what he can do. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, and and unfortunately for me, you know, I was I was in some of the I mean, I think I got through the first heat against Barry B, I think it was, and then I think I was, I think I got through the the next heat, but then I think that that picture that you show there, I think that is actually the the heat where I was against Jazzy Jeff, and that that was like forget it, you know. I mean, Jazzy, as I said, he's a great friend, and he's just he's he's got that you know that that the rhythmical flavour of, yeah, of what he's, he's, got, he's got a way of doing it. It's just oh, silky. Brilliant. You know, he, I mean, he is a jazz musician to me, you know, that's that jazz thing again, you know. Um, so, you know, I was so nervous, you know, I mean, and, and, the, and the needle, there was something weird going on with my needles because obviously I'd come all the way from the UK and all my stuff had been in my suitcase and I think something happened to the needles and, oh, it was just a complete nightmare. But anyway, I, I had the opportunity and the chance, you know, which was just, you know, unheard of at the time really for a, for a you know young skinny white guy from from the uk you know um so i was much indebted to even getting the chance to do that you know now did now did dmc fly you over is that how it worked in those days yeah yeah, you... yeah 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 you yeah. like doing the international circuit without even realizing that you were trailblazing the international circuit yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, after after I became after I came second in the world final in '86, I mean, I did do quite a lot of touring that year. Um, but it was the touring, the world touring, really started when I won the world in in '87. I mean, I went on a two year world tour. Really, I was probably one of the first DJs to properly kind of tour the world and become a bit of a name all over the place. You know. Um, and it was a really interesting experience. I mean, uh, I felt like a bit of an ambassador for the for the turntablism type thing, you know, because I was being sent to a lot of weird places. Like I remember I had a tour of Germany for about two weeks and loads of different venues, real strange venues, like in the middle of nowhere in Germany, some kind of umpire club where, you know, these people, it was almost like a, a social club. These people had no idea of this music or anything to do with this. And I remember I took a friend of mine, Sefton, Sefton Motley, at the time he called himself Sefton Terminator, who was a beatbox, human beatbox. And so we toured, we did this tour, and we were doing it to in the strangest venues. But as I said, I almost felt like a bit of a, a bit of an ambassador to kind of pushing this new sound, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of the a lot of the venues and a lot of the gigs were great, but some of them were really weird, you know, in those that's, early days. That's how I felt with the house music scene when we were doing what we were doing. I, some of us were the first to ever play in some of these areas of the world. Nobody yeah. ever heard this music, like you said. Nobody heard this music. No one knew the style of what we were doing, but they wanted to bring it. And sometimes it was successful, and a lot of times it was dreadful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I was really, I just feel really blessed to have had the opportunity to do things like this, you know? <clears throat> um, and it, it also, it also gave me a, a big connection with, 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 with a lot of New York people. I mean, from, from those visits, you know, I, I kind of got to know people like, um, I mean, I remember Funk and Klein who, who used to work at Def Jam at the offices in Def Jam. 
Uh, Funk and Klein was one of the guys that that helped kind of run and organise the 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 battle for world supremacy at uh, the New Music Seminar. I remember making good friends with him, and I ended up living in Brooklyn at his flat, at his apartment in Brooklyn for a few months. You know, in uh, I think that was kind of kind of end of 87, 88 or whatever. I try, I find it very hard remembering the dates of things. But, um, you know, staying with him, I got the chance to go to the Def Jam offices because I'd been doing mixes on DMC of people like Public Enemy um, and Run DMC and I did uh, remixes of Prince and Grace Jones and loads of different kind of artists, which, again, was a great opportunity, you know, DMC in the early days was the only place that you could get the chance to do these things, you know, Um, because almost, you know, record, even record labels weren't really, hadn't really got into the remixing kind of thing still at that time, you know, Um, and especially mega mixes, DJ mega mixes. I mean, now we can get those all over the place because of the internet, but in those days, yet again, like the radio shows, very few and far between, you know, so, I had the opportunity to to kind of do all those. And as I said, staying with Funk and Klein, I was at the Def Jam offices. I met Chuck D. Um, I mean, those guys really respected the mixes that I did of their stuff on DMC. And uh, so I made good friends with him and Hank Shockley. And uh, remember being in the studio, I think it was Chung King Studios in New York um, when they were recording it's, uh, Takes a Nation of Millions, I think, to hold us back. And... Uh, you know, I, I I used to love Public Enemy. I mean, it, it's the, the the noise terrorism kind of sound that they developed was ah oh, crazy, ah oh, just crazy. Public Enemy type of stuff. And they're not far from me. They're here. They were here in Westbury. Yeah, yeah, they're not far. Right. Yeah. And and also, you said Chung King. Yeah. Now, I'm sure it was Chung King, Steve. The it was a guarantee was Chung King. The guy who owned the studio was named John King. Yeah. So they used to call around the corner to order Chinese food. The guy used to say, just like this, I want egg foo young and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's for John King's studio. And the guy go, yeah, Chung King. And that's how the name Chung King uh, happened from the Chinese guy from the from the from the food spot around the corner. <laughs> you, nobody Chinese owned it, but it sounded great. Chung King. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, and I'm you know, I'm I'm really I mean I remember I remember at that time that, that they were in the studio doing that album, and I remember Hank uh calling me into the studio saying, Can you come in and do some scratching? Because um Johnny Juice used to do the scratches, I remember. Uh, quite a few of the scratches on on a lot of the uh, albums. And apparently he was he was due that day to to go and sign up to the Navy or something, or he had an, uh, something like that. And so they called me in to kind of fill in for him. And so I came in the studio, and I was almost ready to lay some stuff down. And and suddenly Johnny, Johnny Juice walks in and goes, oh, it's okay, man, I'm here, da-da-da-da-da, you know? Um but I did end up to get some stuff on that album anyway. Hank kind of sampled a bit of stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I was just, as I said, I was just this skinny white kid from the UK. I was just amazed that I was actually getting the opportunity to kind of, you know, even meet these people, really, you know. Um, I mean, another another great friend I met um, because of the New York and the DMC connection, really, was people like Bruce Forrest. Um, good old Bruce. I mean, I remember... Um, one of the best times with Bruce, I remember, is being in uh, Trevor Horn's studio, Psalm. In fact, we were at Trevor Horn's Psalm Studios, but we were in Trevor Horn's flat opposite the studio, uh, his studio in his flat, because uh, I think Bruce was staying in Trevor's flat for a while. And Bruce called me over and he went, um, Trevor's said that I can, uh, I can get the... 
get the run of the multi-track room and pick out any multi-tracks I want and just kind of work on some some ideas and remixes and stuff. Do you want to come over? So I was right there, man. <laughs> and for, for a while, we were kind of working on things. We pulled out Grace Jones multi-track, Slave to the Rhythm. We pulled out, you know, um, Yes multi-tracks, owner of a lonely heart, loads of these things out of his actual multi-track room. And uh, that was an, an amazing experience as well, you know. Um, it's just experience, life's experiences, isn't it? You've got to just put yourself out there and, you know, every moment's precious, you know. I mean, now, we'll were, you able, were you able to keep everything going at the same rate or did you have a pitfall as well along the way with changes in the music, changes in styles and things like that along your journey? Well, I've always, I mean, in my DJ journey, I've always kind of followed any new music that comes about. I mean, I, I remember I, I, when I won the mixing championships, <clears throat> um, obviously that was, I was very much hip hop based at the time. But then a couple of years after that, obviously I started to move into, um, well, I mean, the house thing had already started to play at the Hacienda. So, you know, I, I was doing gigs and, and moving with the times, if you like, whatever music was coming in and starting. I mean, I remember following stuff in the the early kind of rave scene. Or I remember we all went to Ibiza. I mean, that good old trip of everybody from the UK who went to Ibiza and got kind of went to Amnesia and kind of saw the light. Wait, wait, no, no. Explain that. Who was in that trip with you and you all went together? Let's hear this. Well, there was there was a trip. I think DMC organised a trip very early on, and there was lots of um, lots of the uh, A and R and promotions kind of guys and girls from the record companies, and there was a, a few DJs. And I remember I was there. I remember Paul Oakenfold and all the guys, you know, Daddy Rampley and all those guys that kind of got influenced and, and so much by the Ibiza thing and Alfredo, Alfredo and Amnesia and stuff like that, that they ended up creating that Balearic kind of scene, you know? Um, <clears throat> I remember go, we all went there very early on. And uh, I remember just being really into people like Alfredo because it was very much the same thing that, that myself and a lot of others were doing at the Hacienda in those early days, playing a lot of different styles, you know, mixing it up. And it was just kind of about good music, you know, rather than good music of one particular style, you know? Um, so that was just a real, a real big eye opener, you know, especially, especially obviously for, for Oki and um, the rest of them, because they, they kind of really took that on board and then, you know, pushed pushed that Balearic sound. You know, yeah, but you got to also make sure to understand this that there was tempo changes through the night. There was different tempos. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're exposing the people, you would yeah. take us on a ride from a fast record and bring it right down and start again, like a reset, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that because because I've always been so eclectic in my music taste. That for me, that was that was always you know what I was about. Anyway, you know, I mean, that's uh, that part of one of the downsides of what I've been through in the past was was getting so involved in the hip hop scene for a while that it's almost like, you know, when, when you become quite successful initially, whatever you're doing at that point, I think that's that's what people stick on to you. And I was never that. I mean, I remember kind of a little further on from that when I had my hair the drummer get wicked hit. I remember. Um, when I did that, the tracks I was playing out DJing weren't really tracks kind of like that. I mean, they were quite diverse things. I mean, I was playing kind of bits of kind of breakbeat kind of hip hop, but also playing things like 808 State, Pacific State, and things like that, you know. Um, so I've always been very diverse with the musical styles. Um, and that's one of the downsides I found. For a while, I was kind of stuck in a in a little kind of corner of that's how that's what people perceive me to be. But and that's I, because so, that's general because that's generally how pop and overground works. Yeah. The minute that you pop out of that underground thing, which you've yeah. been in bubble, sort sort of in a bubble. Yeah. Now you go into their world. Now they only know you for one thing. Yeah. And yeah, it's, exactly. tough. it's tough. It's tough to shed. It's like, wait a minute. I do this. Th no, no, no. We just want that one thing. You're like, yeah. yeah, that's not me. Yeah. I mean, that's probably, 
I mean, that's probably why I've I've never really. I mean, I'm not, I'm quite I'm quite a private individual, and I don't quite often I don't really divulge a lot of the things that 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 I'm into or maybe that I can do. I mean, things like the you know playing the piano and stuff like that. I've never really talked that much about that because it's just part of me. You know, it's like for me, it's not that important. It's just part of the whole thing. You know, but really, I mean, things like that have helped with my production career because I've already already got that that kind of background of knowing chords and things so you know um so then and then give us the back the back story of hear the drummer get wicked you okay know, well what happened when what what led leads up to that you know well because of the dmc mixes i've been doing I'd, obviously i built up quite a name and uh, a label, a London label contacted me and basically said, you know, we've we've signed this track, um, DJ Mark, the 45 King, the 900 number, you know. And, you know, I knew it immediately the track they meant because I've been playing it in the clubs. It was one of the biggest records at that time, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I remember saying, oh, yeah, I, I know that track. You know, they were saying, would you like to do a remix of it? So I was like, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the reasons I said yeah was because I mean they didn't have a multi-track from what I remember but uh, they wanted some kind of remix of this and I because I've because I've been collecting records and collecting rare breaks and break hunting for so many years already I already had um, earmarked in my sample collection the Marvel Whitney on Wine Yourself saxophone loop um which was the basis of the nine hundred number, you know? So I already had, I remember reading in a, in a book a while ago that I'd already written down in ideas. I'd written down, you know, Marvel Whitney sax loop tune idea, you know? So I'd already earmarked this thing as like, this, this is just, this is a real good hook, you know? And the nine hundred number came along and it was kind of like, Oh man, this other guy has done it. you know. But I got off of this remix and I was kind of like, yeah, I could do that because I've got the original sax loop. So I can go, to the original sax loop and build it up from there, you know, because there wasn't really any parts, you know, and it was, as you know, it was only a two bar loop anyway, you know, the actual original track, which was absolute classic in my opinion. But, uh, <clears throat> so, so I started work on this remix and I took it from the, you know, the ground up. I started looking for samples and sounds and bits that I wanted to construct to create it. Um, and I was put in a studio with uh, with a guy called Steve Mack, who um, I've worked with two, two Steve Macks. There's a Steve Mack who's kind of the house DJ and, and, and house and techno kind of producer uh, who, I've, who I've worked with since. Yeah, that's Steve in the middle with the bald head. <laughs> like Dr. Evil there. Yeah, you Dr. Evil. <laughs> Dr. Dr. He's Steve Mack's also very talented, very talented chap. Yeah, he's really not evil at all. Um, and the other, Steve, the other Steve Mack, um, who I did Hear the Drummer Get Wicked with, he was um, he was just starting out in his career. So uh, the studio that he worked at was hired for me to uh, make this record. And uh, Steve has since gone on to become like Songwriter of the Year. I think it was last year or the year before. He's worked with people like, I don't know, I think he's worked with Westlife and loads of different pop bands. I mean, he's become a real big kind of pop songwriter producer, you know. But this was his first kind of, his first job, really, uh, in the industry. Because he could, he was a programmer using the Fairlight, the old Fairlight sample. Everybody starts somewhere. He's there. Yeah. He's not somewhere. So you're the first to break him in. You get him on the Fairlight sampler. Go ahead. Yeah. So he's 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 doing all the programming. So he can, you know, I didn't I didn't understand much about all the intricacies of music production in those days. Um, and also, you know, a Fairlight was such a complicated thing at the time, and it cost as much as a house that there was no way I was going to know how to use a Fairlight because I couldn't afford one. So he was the operator, and I had all the ideas. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. You know, so I went in there and I think the first day I just gave him loads of samples. I was like, right, here's this loop, sample that, right? I want this loop, sample that, sample this, da -da -da, right? I want that there, that there, that there, that there. And then I played a bass line in and then I played a couple of other things in and I was like, right, okay, put that in the beginning and we'll have that in that section. And I kind of had it all in my head, 
you know? I mean, quite often with productions, that's how I do it. I actually work everything out in my head. And then I've kind of got this blueprint of what I want to do, you know? Um, <clears throat> so, so in the words of the technical end, you gain the samples and then you want to do the overdubbing. But you playing the parts, based yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Stuff, right? yeah, absolutely. I was I was throwing other bits in over the top, so it was a mixture of kind of original played stuff and also samples and loops. So, can yeah. I ask you another question? Was this also at the beginning of what we would call MIDI programming? Kind of the beginning, not the very beginning. I mean, the beginnings of MIDI were eighty three. I mean, that's when eighty three. Eighty three was when MIDI was developed by uh, Korg and Sony and and. Uh, Roland and all them people. Um, well, I think it was Korg and Roland and someone else, not Sony. I might be wrong. Anyway, um, so this was, you know, this was uh, this was 1990. So MIDI had developed quite well by then, you know. Um, but the sampler thing, the, the Furlight was the thing because it was probably one of the first. I mean, it was one of the first samplers, you know. So I had the, I actually had the opportunity to to be able to construct this thing, which wouldn't have been possible before, you know? Um, and the, the way I, the way I structured it as well, I wanted it to be very, I almost wanted it to sound like it was played by a band rather than being just loads of cut ups. So I wanted it to sound quite organic, you know, and kind of all the pieces kind of fit and flow together. And in a way, I think I, pr I achieved that because I do listen to it nowadays, and I'm still quite proud of it. I mean, it, you know, it really still stands up. You know, um, it. I, f I personally, I feel it's not really dated too much. You know, it still sounds quite hot now. You know, um, so it was quite pre-planned. You know, I'm, I'm quite OCD. I'm I'm quite. Um, you know, I'll, I'll plan things to the nth degree uh, sometimes. Uh, and you know, it, it got released. Well, it was originally released as a white label, um, and they press it as a white label as uh, 900 number Chad Jackson remix. But I think the day they sent it to get pressed, I think the guy who ran the record label kind of had a meeting with me and said, Well, we've been listening to this, and kind of it, it's because I'd used the Hear the Drummer Get Wicked thing as the hook and different other bits. They were saying this is almost like a, a new record rather than a remix. You know, we're going to actually, we're going to actually release this as as your track. And obviously, I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know. So that white label's really rare now with the nine hundred number Chad Jackson remix. That is actually Chad Jackson here to drum and get wicked, a very early kind of version. Um, but did but did you have to assign a contract that you produced that, or is that still under the remix setting? Well, that was kind of under the remix heading, but actually, it was it was the, it was those early days, early untried and untested days of sampling. You know, when I, you know, I obviously, being quite young and green, left everything in the hands of the record company. Um, thick sampling hadn't really been sorted out in those days with the with the court cases like the Bismarcky case, I think, in ninety two, I think that was, and stuff like that. You know, so it's still a very grey area. People were st were thinking things like, if you sample a certain amount of seconds, it's okay, and all this. So I just pieced all this together without any any knowledge of any of that. You know, um, so it got released as my track. Um, ended up going to I think in the UK number three and number one in the dance chart, and um, and suddenly I, I was like on top of the pop big kind of the big music pop show at the time over here and uh and that was a dream come true really that um, is a dream. that's a major dream to get that chance to perform on that show yeah and uh and then you know i, I did a few i did even more remixes of of other people's uh tunes people like norman cook fat boy slim beats international and various other things uh <laughs> And then suddenly the, the the came the letters from lawyers for the tunes that had been sampled because obviously it was such a big hit that it's it has has seemed to be the case over the years where you know where does as as the saying goes where does a hit there's a writ you know um, and the minute it was a hit and they knew that there was kind of money being made from this obviously understandably they were kind of contacting the label saying you know you've sampled our our 
you know, published work. You know, we need to sort out percentages and this, that and the other. So it ended up all these legal wrangles of sorting out percentages after the event, you know, after it had been released. Um, and various, I mean, some of the samples I'd cleared myself, but I'd, I'd, I presume that that had been, that was kind of okay. I mean, the Heater Drummer Get Wicked sample, I remember when I actually used that, I phoned Chuck D um, from Public Enemy and said, Chuck, man, Chuck, I've used your Heater Drummer Get Wicked kind of sample. Do you mind? And he was like, man, that's fine, you know? I mean, he was really cool with it because obviously... Yeah, sure. Yeah, because obviously they use samples in the work and it's, you know, it's it's cool. And uh, But then after the event, a couple of years later, you know, the, uh, some lawyer ends up getting in contact about that one as well, you know, saying that this is published by us, you know, da 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 da, da. So in the end, I think I ended up getting about um, something like 15 20% or something of that trap. But, I mean, I feel quite blessed to be granted that amount, really, because the amount of samples that were in it, you know. Um, and but at the end of the day, I'd, I'm a firm believer in paying people for – paying people their dues, you know, not – the first record that actually pulled the flags of samples was um, that Mars record that CJ produced. Yeah, pump up the volume. Yeah, Ooh, he used yeah. everybody's set. It's like ninety samples in there. Everybody came out of the woodwork. Yeah. Not at first. When the record exploded, then the lawyers were like yeah. sharks. They came in with cease and desist everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. When, yeah. That's when sampling started to become like, wait a minute. It's a new form of music. We need to look at this, and there's got to be a legalized way of using the samples. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, actually, with that record. I remember on DMC, <laughs> quite a few months before that, I'd done a, this DMC, and it was like an original track on DMC called Pump Up the Volume, using the same vocal. I didn't do it nearly as well as, as Mars, Pump Up the Volume. You know, a totally different record. I think I was even rapping on it or something. I don't know. I mean, I used to try some crazy kind of experimental ideas sometimes on DMC. But uh, I remember that was a very hot sample, that. You know, it was very current. I mean, quite a lot of things in music production, I find, you know, the ideas, ideas for songs and ideas for, samples and sounds it's all out there you've just got to have yourself tuned in to be able to pull it down from the ether you know and anybody can pull it down and quite often these ideas get pulled down at vaguely the same time because there's this mass consciousness thing going on in a way you know um so you know with the with the sampling thing i ended up obviously going through this kind of uh period of of well, I was I was working on a on a on an album after Hear the Drummer Get Wicked, um, and then I ended up splitting up with my manager, and I think my 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 lawyer tried to sue me because he because uh, I'd not got any money through from the label because the label had closed down immediately after they got the big check from my record in, and all this craziness you know that happens in the music business, and uh, so I ended up. At, kind of with this having done this kind of album to follow up and just ending up without a manager and without a label and and i mean it, it's a funny time but I've, I've actually still got the recordings of that album and, and it's interesting because as i said i wasn't just i wasn't just into hip-hop or into dj sample records i was kind of a musician when i got to, a chance to work on this album i i was doing there was tracks on the album like there was a six eight kind of jazz tune because he's kind of Latin American jazz tune and things like that. You know, I was really spreading my wings on this album. It may not have been a very good follow up to the actual single because quite a lot of it was quite different from, you know, a DJ sample kind of cut up record. But, uh, you know, I've still got those recordings and interestingly enough, I've, I've, I've been uh, remastering a couple of them recently and realizing that actually they they stand up quite well at the moment. So I'm, I'm almost planning some kind of release in the future of unreleased kind of stuff, you know? When exactly was this that you were no manager and now no record label? Around what time of your life was this? This was like the kind of the end of 1990, beginning of 1991. Uh, excuse me. So, you know, it's, 
it was it was one of the times where I suddenly went kind of down. What you said before about the down times, this was I really went down. I mean, I got quite depressed about it. That's um, not what you explain to people because people would think that we all everything is hunky dory, everything is in the clouds, yeah. and you're coming off a huge hit. Yeah. And now yeah. you're in a different place. You're like not and not too far after. Yeah. And you know, it it, it I did definitely go into a bit of a depression. Um I didn't really know which way to turn. One of the funny things, which I have heard, heard other people say about these times, you know, because I'd had such a big hit record, the DJ kind of dried up a little bit because people kind of thought, oh, you're, you know, you've gone big time now. You're, um, you know, you've gone overground. You're not underground anymore. You know, all that kind of stuff, which isn't really the way it is anymore, you know. Nowadays, it's all about success, isn't it, you know. But then it, it was kind of about being real and kind of, you know, not getting too successful. And the minute you're too successful, oh, you, you, you know. So it's a weird, weird time, weird time. It's, it's kind of like what they say, outclassing yourself. You outclassed yourself from the underground, from the cool. Now you're on the yes. overground commercial side. We can't, we can't play around with you anymore. It's like, yeah, what? what? So... I mean, that really weirded me out for a start, but then it, it you know, gradually, I mean, I, I can't remember how long it was, but I gradually started to get into, um, you know, learning more about music production and, and, and having my own studio set up, you know. Um, and I got the opportunity to, with Ministry of Sound, actually, when, when MP3s first appeared in, like, I don't know, when they started to get popular, maybe in, like, 90, 95, 96, 97. I remember uh, a friend of mine, DJ Decane, who was also another DMC mixer, he uh, gave me the opportunity to to get involved with him doing some, doing a, a, a university tour, uh, DJing with MP3s and like a, a computer and this this special new system that they they'd kind of, uh, somebody they've been in contact with had developed, you know. So it was this brand new thing of DJing with MP3s, which I wouldn't really do anymore because I'm so aware of the quality of of audio files and music nowadays, you know. But MP3s at the time were a really new thing, and so I was holding these workshops in these various universities in in the UK, and I I kind of got the the bug really for for kind of teaching and for lecturing really. For passing on knowledge, you know. Um, so that's when the that's when the lecturing kind of started, really. You know, um, I started lecturing music production because I'd learnt so much having a studio at home by then that it was a natural progression to try and pass some of this kind of knowledge on. You know, um, so I started DJ music production and various other things at uh, various different uh, universities and, and places in, in the UK. And really getting into that for quite a while, you know. I mean, I remember um, I used to, I, I was involved in, I mean, I developed courses for a company called Rock School, and those courses are used in in a lot of um, further education, higher education establishments, like schools doing extra higher education um, qualifications and things like that. So, you know, I got quite deep into the, the lecturing thing um, and really enjoyed it. You know, uh, as I said, passing on the knowledge and trying to pass on these skills that I'd learned uh, and seeing the development of things like YouTube at the time with, with uh, music production tutorials and things, um, really kind of changing the landscape of, of, of teaching and lecturing. Really. And also the creation of, which we didn't ever have before, the social media game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learning yeah. how to now maneuver in a young man's game or kids. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And reinventing and reinvent it. and reinventing yourself because you had to reinvent yourself again, like we all did. Yeah, I mean, I did find that there was a weird period. I remember the year two thousand because everybody was quite hyper and aware of all this. Oh, the year 2000, all the computers are going to go haywire because, you know, they're not clocks are not set up right. I mean, it ended up it was all just a load of nonsense, really. But, you know, I remember 
I remember there was it was it was almost like people thought the world was going to end after the year two thousand. And I remember the DJ. I remember DJ fees for that night were just astronomically high. It was just like really weird what happened, and that almost it was almost like that killed the club scene for a little while because it was like overkill and suddenly over here anyway. It was it was a bit of a strange period, you know. Um, yeah. Very strange. Millennial New Year's Eves. Being able to play one, two, or three gigs in the night and yeah. hating it. Everybody who worked that night made a fortune. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But it was a change coming. Yeah. Not too long after, right around that time, I'll never forget, LimeWire begins. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're like, wait a minute. With all the music we're making, they're giving away for free. What's Napster, wrong? Napster, and Livewire, and all that. Oh, yeah, we yeah. Were, like, we were sick. I remember I was sick to my stomach seeing all that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the one of the one of the unfortunate things from all that, really, in more recent years, is that you know a lot of that stuff, a lot of that stuff was MP3, and now people are st- obviously in past past years have realized that you know mp3 compared to aif or wav or flac is just you know it's just too much too many of the frequencies cut out and compressed files you know so lots of people have, have moved on from that but unfortunately not not enough people really you know so many people are still quite in the dark about the differences of mp3 and that's what i found fascinating with the with the lecturing career and teaching music production you know i've I've taught a lot of stuff about things like audio fundamentals to uh, young producers, which is all about file types and, you know, mastering and getting, you know, getting the, your sound as good as you can make it, you know? So lots of really deep, deep kind of stuff, which I must admit, one thing I did find, Lenny, is doing the lecturing really honed my skills within music production as well. I mean, I ended up having to learn a lot of stuff that I was a little bit kind of shaky on. You know, because I've never been to college to learn any of this. I've just learned it, you know, off on my own or or learning from other people who I could meet or knew or you know. So there was very much a a, a period of me learning a lot of stuff myself. You know, it really spurred me on to get a lot deeper with my knowledge. You know, and, um, kept, and kept you relevant and fresh because you're dealing with young kids and yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's I mean, a thing, there's there's a borrowing and giving that's going. Yeah, on. I, mean, I mean, I felt very. I mean, all the time I've been lecturing, um, I felt really honoured in a way to to be an older person who has a connection, more of a connection with 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 younger people who are making music than you might normally have, you know, because our you know generations are, are split from each other sometimes, you know, which is a bit of a shame, but. Uh, and you know, I, I I I found it fascinating. As I said, I, I was always following new musical styles. I mean, you know, from from the hacienda going into kind of rave music, going into kind of going into hardcore, and then jungle, and then drum and bass, and then kind of you know various other styles, and then kind of dubstep. I remember when I was teaching, um, and dubstep started to appear. I mean, I found that sound really really fascinating because. You know, there was elements of hip hop from what I could hear, but there was also elements of drum and bass and elements of reggae. You know, it was in, totally kind of mixed mixed up within that sound with with these really big, extreme, modern um, kind of digital versions of of kind of bass sounds. You know, that it was all about it was all about that wob wobble on the bass and stuff. You know, with the dubstep stuff. You know. So I found all that fascinating because I had a, I had, I was plumbed right into the to the kids, if you like, to where they were coming from and what was, what 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 they were loving and what they wanted to make, you know. And I I've always felt quite blessed to have been given that opportunity, you know, being an old fart. Now, yeah, the elder statesman, an elder statesman who told us a story. Here's the thing that I noticed with your history. You are very, very versatile musically. That you've been able to do sets from all genres of music, inclusive of even adding rock into your sets. So 
good on you on that one because there's not many of us that can do that and do it right. And you seem to got that feather in your cap. It's it's weird. It's almost like I couldn't I couldn't help it because I'm into so many different styles of music that if I was just playing one very narrow style of music all the time, I'd get too very quickly bored. Well, there's a reason why I'm going to say this. Check this out, everybody. And he's so proud. He's going to tell you how proud of this this picture. Right uh, before lockdown, this is Chad behind the wheels of steel. Rocking that crowd with his sound. So he says uh, I'm a little fart, right? But look, but look what's in front of him. Oh, uh, that, that was just just before the lockdown, that was one of the best festivals that I'd played. That was actually at uh, Blue Dot Festival, which is like a science-based uh festival, which was held at Jodrell Bank Observatory um in the UK, uh with the great big uh observatory dish that you can see just behind the the kind of light stack on the stage there in the distance, the great big huge that, that's found amazing discoveries in the universe. You know, I was I was playing in front of that dish and I just felt so honoured, man. I really did. The Deep Space Disco at uh, Blue Blue Dot Festival, that was just, that was a gig and a half. I even had, um, I even had uh, Dr. Maggie, who's one of the presenters of a, of a, a program on BBC over here called the Sky at Night, which is all about kind of you know obviously the Sky at Night, the galaxy and universe, etc. She was actually at, at the event. She was on stage behind me, dancing her ass off, man. This <laughs> she's like a professor scientist thing, and she was just having it, man. And the little little memories like that. It's like, it's like that Pulp Fiction moment. We're both going like this. And- oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Check yeah. out this everyone. Look, look at Chad's single. <laughs> Hear the drummer. Get wicked. Chad Jackson. Look at him. <laughs> Man, Chad, what a life you you have had and still having. Well, I've I've probably for, I've forgotten half of it, but um, you know, the, the older you get, the more things become a little bit hazy. You know, I mean, I've 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 kind of been um, also. You know, things recently, like my radio show, Journey Through My Record Collection, um, we, I've kind of been really enjoying really enjoying that because that's that's very much comes from my, what you were saying before, my ethos of uh, being very eclectic. I mean, I, I tend to play. His library, everyone. Look at it really well. The library. <sighs> Well, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. It's kind of in front of those, really. Um, and my radio show, I do try. I mean, it's probably a hard radio show for, for 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 listeners out there, maybe because it's so eclectic. I mean, one moment you might hear a real classic rare disco track, the other moment you might hear a a kind of um, a very electronic kind of chuggy Andrew Weatherall type kind of you know track. Um, it's I, I kind of intend the, the show to be almost like uh, inspiration to producers and DJs out there, more so producers and people in studios to maybe inspire them with the music they're making. I almost make it for myself in a way to try and inspire myself with with what I might want to do in the studio, you know, trying to pick things out that are interesting, might have interesting samples, might have interesting sounds or production sounds or you know songs or particular interesting time signatures anything you know just it's it's like a pick from all different styles in that show and that's really you know a very personal thing you know it's the kind of show i i, I love doing really you know and we want to we want we want to make sure you stay doing it because we need those shows chad thanks man it's uh, it's a, it's a lot of work <laughs> researching and, and preparing the tracks for each show but it's okay uh, it's all right uh, it's, it makes you you, you know, you, 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 you hand pick it, you make sure it's right and you stand behind it. Like you said, it stands up against everything else around it and stands well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, hopefully people, people enjoy it. I mean, you know, where can they, where can they hear this show? Cause I haven't heard you mention where you're actually having the show play each week. Um, at, the mo- at the moment it's on music box radio. 
uh, I think that's musicboxradio.co.uk, which is an internet station that a friend of mine runs. Um, and it's actually my shows only once a month because I do find I do find that the amount of research and the amount of hunting that I do for that show, and even doing it monthly, it's a hell of a lot of work because I'm really can't quite um, more. I'm really, really fussy with with choosing the tunes for the show. It's kind of like, I suppose if it was weekly, I'd have more of a turnover of tunes that I could play, and it wouldn't be quite as intense. But it because it's monthly, I spend the whole month really wandering through loads of stuff, old, new, borrowed, blue, whatever you know. And uh, it's almost like a it's a it's a it's a passion, really. It's a it's a kind of calling. It's a it's a madness. It's a <laughs> whatever of a. It's word. an addiction. An addiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And my my, my quite often um, failing possibly of doing too much preparation and too much preparation and then 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 a bit more preparation. You know. <laughs> oh man. You did great, my brother. You did great. It's it, I, I'm so proud to say that we've had you on. You your insight, excellent, and I can't thank you enough, Chad. You are a legend of the game, a real legend of the game. And you've seen different styles of music come and go. And we will see what else is up your sleeve. This is this story's not over yet. We still got more to do, don't we? Believe me, man, I got a long list. And some stuff I've already been working on. I can't wait to re- can't wait to get this out there. I mean, it's that good old the last two years of lockdown getting in the way of a lot of things, you know. Um, let's just fingers crossed and pray that we all kind of you know get through this without too much loss. I mean, I know a lot of people have had a bit of loss already, including myself. And uh, you know, it just constantly reminds me to we've all just got to. We've all just got to live every every moment as a real precious thing, you know, and get the most out of them. So that's that's the best advice I can give to anybody, including myself. And uh, thanks a lot for having me on, Lenny. I really, really, I'm 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 honoured to be in such a steam company of all your guests and yourself. And uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed it. It's uh, it's been real. Well, you wrapped up the year for us. Thank you, Chad Jackson, 2021. He has wrapped it up. We're going to be taking a break, everyone, for a little bit, a couple of weeks, and we'll be coming strong in January. Chad's drinking already. He's wishing everyone happy holidays. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas and a happy new year to everyone out there. We will see you in the new year. Stay tuned. We've got a lot of stuff happening. And Chad, good luck to you, brother, on the endeavors and what's coming up in front. We know it'll be great. To everyone yeah. around the world, have a very good night. Again, season's greetings and stay safe. Big love for 2022, Namaste. Lenny. Love Namaste. you, man. Namaste. And thank you, Chad. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Hang on, Chad, one second. <laughs>